So good morning. Welcome to the ground runs. My name is Xiaofeng Yang. I'm assistant professor of medical physics in radiation oncology department. It's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Dizzy from Memorial Sloan Cattery Cancer Center, New York. Dr. Dizzy is a attending physicist, physicist and the chair of the Department of Medical Physics and the holder of the Eli Hopt Indoor Chair in Medical Physics. He received his PhD in physics from University of Kentucky in 1992. Thereafter, he completed an age funded postdoc fellowship at the University of Wisconsin Medicine. Before arriving at the Memorial Cancer Center in 2010, Dr. Dizzy spent 11 years in the Depart Department of the Radiation, Radiation Ecology, Washington University, and in uh, St. Louis. First in the physics division under the direction of the James uh, Purdy. After and led as the first director of the division of the bioinformatics and the outcoming research. Dr. Dizzy is a co-author of the around 140 peer-reviewed publications, has been the peers of several NH grants, including RYS. Dr. Dizzy currently interesting are in applying applying mathematical modeling and machine learning to the analysis of the imaging, genomic, and treatment data sets in order to understand the relationship between the treatment patient and the disease characteristics, and the probability of the disease progression and the treatment response. Today, Dr. Dizzy will give us a talk titled uh, Predicting Outcome in the Oncology using integrated data analysis method, radiomics, genomics, uh, genomics and pathology, and uh, clinical data. Please join me in welcome Dr. Dizzy. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> thank you for that very nice introduction, Xiaofang. Uh, thank you, Wally, uh, and the rest of the group for the invitation. I see this uh, wonderful quote, the future always belongs to the discontented. Um, sometimes it belongs to the discontented, but I will, I will say I'm very discontent with, uh, uh, with my career so far. Uh, 20 years ago, we, uh, I listened to talks by um, people like Anders Brahma and Jack Fowler. And I thought, well, what we're going to do is we're going to put together mathematical models of predicting normal tissue complication probability, tumor control probability. This is the early 90s now. It's more than 20 years ago. Uh, and that's going to work. And then we're going to move all that into the, into the, the clinic. Um, and, and we're going to be doing treatment planning on a personalized basis. And obviously, you know, not only are we not there, we've, we've, I would say we've got at least uh, 10 years to get there. Um, so that's, that's one comment, is to say I am among the ranks of the discontent. Uh, the second comment is I'd like for you to listen to this uh, discussion this morning and think, and I'm, and I'm going to dig into our, our problems, the issues that we've selected. You should be thinking, what are the clinical decisions that I have to make, which could be positively improved if we really knew some of the underlying factors that cause variance in outcome. What are the, what are the cases, you know, what, what are the clinical decisions that have to be made where if you, really, if you really had a better analysis of the data, a deeper understanding of the causal factors, uh, you could change clinical practice. That's, I think that's the real way to uh, uh, to listen to what I'm uh, saying, which is, is an advertisement uh, for more, more kinds of research like this, integrative research that puts together imaging, treatment planning information, uh, genom and genomics, and it's, and it's coming to quantitative pathology as well. Now, I have a lot of slides, and, and I usually end up rushing through a few. But uh, please, uh, don't hesitate to stop me if you've got a burning question. I'll be happy to answer it. Um, I like to think of this as information-driven radiotherapy. I don't call it big data radiotherapy because, frankly, 
In medicine, we don't have big data. I mean, except for very rare instances. We're, <laughs> the computer scientists call our situation low shot data, low shot learning. Okay, and that's, <laughs> that's kind of a, uh, a very negative term, so it's not going to be adopted in medicine. But, uh, but we're not in the realm of big data, although we'd like to, uh, although it's very clear that data pooling is an absolutely key issue. We don't do it, it's not our culture, but we need to do more of it. So let's call it information-driven uh, radiotherapy. Uh, and I, I go to meetings. I don't do anything myself. I do help edit things, but other people do the work. And I get to come and give talks and so on, but I'll try to mention the names of the people who actually did the work uh, as we go along. Uh, I did help found a computational pathology company. I'm not going to talk about that very much, but there's the disclosure, and we get uh, research from various groups, and these days you have to get money wherever you can. Uh, so, as I mentioned, there are lots of potential inputs to modeling, and on probably half of what our group does is figures out how to put data together, what, what the different kinds of data really mean, uh, how to put it together, we'll, and, and we're just going to talk about some examples of that. I think medical physics could play a much bigger role in the, in the, in the future of image driven medicine, both on the radiology side and on the radiation oncology side. Medical physicists um, have quantitative skills that are um, not in abundance in the, in the medical center, and, and uh, medical physicists could be leaders at putting together high quality image-based data sets uh, across institutions. Medical physicists can help implement very uh, uh, context-sensitive or uh, customized data extraction processes. And uh, medical physicists should step forward, I think, and be uh, you can, uh, you can both team players and leaders in this. We tend, as a group in medical physicists, we tend to hang back and say, well, we're not really experts in that. To which I always say, you think the physicians are experts at everything? No, they've been trained to just get in there and, you know, make things happen. Okay. Where would we like to be? You'd like to be in an era of quantitative oncology. Well, what does that mean? This would be where the data that goes into the information systems are machine readable, computable, and reliable. And that is not the case today. You've got some very busy resident working late at night trying to get some records in and uh, and the interface is asking for some piece of information and she has no idea why this piece of information is, is useful and, and, you know, and there's kind of a law of nature that the, 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 the less the person putting data into a system is invested in the potential use of that system, the less reliable the data is. And that's the, that's the realm we're in today. We're not in a realm of quantitative medicine because you can't use this stuff. Also, we do dictation now, and we don't do it into, it's not parsed into machine readable terms. Now that could be, sorry, that could be solved uh, over the next uh, five years, say. Uh, and I think you're going to be seeing dictation systems that basically know what they're looking for and prompt the user to say, you didn't answer this question, I'd, and then the physician will dictate another sentence. Boom, and then all the information will become slotted and machine readable. But I'm not gonna get into that anymore, but uh, so there's you know, data input and so on. We often get more than 100 images per patient at Memorial Sloan Kettering. If you put all the cone beams, the MRIs, the CTs, the PET CTs, you, uh, the diagnostic imaging, if you put it all together, you have 100 images. Six months later, it's very difficult to figure out why did we take all these images exactly the way we did, exactly when we took these images. 
So information that's not contextualized and linked to the patient's story rots. It's like, it's like food in a refrigerator. Sooner or later, it becomes useless. So we're carrying around petabytes of data that's going to get harder and harder and harder to do anything with because we don't organize it. So that's another hurdle to being in a true era of quantitative oncology. Current data sources require curation in order to ensure accuracy. You can't take any data out of a clinical data system today and, and go to uh, straight to a publication. Everybody knows that. Um, so as I mentioned, hopefully in the future data will be more automated, more reliable, and more usefully organized. So the traditional biostatistical problem would be to basically say, I'm going to intervene in this, uh, one group of patients will be treated one way, another group of patients will be treated another way that differs only by this change in one factor, dose, the drug, whatever it is, and then we're just gonna see if the null hypothesis is Still, still holds, but we're also, we'll also look at effect size and so on. That's the traditional biostatistical problem in the era we're in now, the era of big data, the era, the era of cars that are going to autonomously drive themselves, the era of artificial intelligence. In an era where the number of predictors are large compared to the number of endpoint observations, and these old rules, 10 data points for every variable, whatever you were taught, just do not apply. Now, how, how have the computer scientists gotten out of this rut? They basically uh, got, gotten out of it um, by not overfitting the, uh, their models and their various, I'm not gonna get into the details of, uh, in too many cases, although I'll come back to the lasso method, just one, just one method. Typically, don't overfit models. How do you tell that you haven't overfit a model? Well, you have a modeling process, okay? You have some sort of modeling process. You could apply it to all the data with, with, all, with these colored objects here. I'll pretend every one of those is a patient. You could apply it to all the data, but you could also apply the whole modeling process to say 10%, uh, to, to say 90% of the data and hold out 10% of the data. And you could repeat that 10 times. And then looking at the variance of how well the model does on the data you didn't use to build the model, you get an idea if you're fooling yourself, okay? So every, so in this, in this new area with this, with this type of research, you're always going to be looking, well, what's the structure of the cross? In the paper, you're always going to be looking at how do they do cross-validation to, to see that they didn't fool themselves. I'm going to come back to some, uh, what I call seven deadly sins of predictive modeling at the end. But a couple of other things um, need to be said. First of all, you have to put the whole process into the cross-validation loop. If you select your predictors before you ever do any cross-validation, you've already biased yourself. Okay, secondly, papers that uh, are considered to be the most valid, clinical decision support models that are considered to be the most valid, look at other data that was completely separate from any part of the process. That's called external validation, okay? And this, and so you're really always gonna be looking for uh, some other data set the farther away from your data set, the better. So another institution, dates that are uh, different from the dates in which this data was gotten. If you want to dig into this further, um, the Stanford Statistics Group, probably one of the most spectacular academic groups um, in the world. Um, the two of them, uh, Bradley Efren and, and Trevor Hasty have written, this, this is my favorite book in this area. It just came out, Computer Aid Statistical Inference. Um, and it's full of great uh, information on how to, how to deal with this uh, large number of variable uh, problem, but relevant to many, many applications relevant to medicine, Kaplan-Meier analyses and so on. 
Okay, what are the tools? Um, I can't give a talk without on this without mentioning our own open source toolkit called CERR, uh, C-E-R-R, -R, the Computational Environment for Radiotherapy Research. We actually, I should up, I have to update this slide, we actually call it the Computational Environment for Radiological Research now because it will really, you can bring in series of images, they can be PET, CT, MR, what have you, but you can bring in all of your dose volume information, everything from the treatment planning system, all the contours. It has contouring tools. It has, it's linked to the formal imaging uh, uh, registration tools like PlastiMatch. It's been uh, uh, cited over 400 times in the peer-reviewed literature. It's very stable. Every once in a while we discover a bug, but not very often. So that's a good tool. Uh, we're, we're also now have a complete set of so-called radiomics features that are in uh, that are in this toolkit. I'm going to come back to these. So, from for a given image, you can look at the the image characteristics. Um, and I'm putting and I'm not I'm, yeah I'm parotid land here. And in this parotid land, you can look at statistical characteristics of the. Um, intensity volume histogram, the, the shape of the object, size, the so-called texture features. There are now literally hundreds of these features that you can derive uh, from an image. They all amount to uh, little filters. And uh, we're also in the era of deep learning now where, uh, all, and, and I'm not going to go into deep learning, but in deep learning, you're basically attempting to discover the right features automatically uh, uh, from an application of deep learning um, algorithms. So this, this is a toolbox that can be used for radiomics research. You can look at how these features uh, 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 sort of look in a map of uh, here are the breasts. And this is a so-called uh, entropy feature. I'm not going to go into the details of what that is. I'm going to run through that. But I d even though we're, in, we're extracting all these different kinds of features, and, we're, and, and I'm taking, trying to take a data-driven approach to things, modeling based on basic principles of radiobiology is still very important, in my view. Um, and I, and, I'm, and a lot of what we're doing is trying to put these two things together. So let's talk about an attempt to make a model of tumor response. Okay, so what do we know? We know that the model has to take into account things like proliferation, hypoxia, and this one's a little bit uh, novel, the competition for resources. Cells that are very hypoxic, we're going to assume they're not proliferating, okay? So there's this competition for resources. Yes, proliferation's a problem. Yes, hypoxia is a problem. But they're not a problem at the same time in the same cell, okay? So there's a competition for resources. Um, why use a model? The, the primary reason we want to use it even, even, you know, we can test our concepts, so have, we can have some idea if we're going in the right direction, but ultimately we want to predict how a patient's going to respond to radiotherapy and use it in the clinic. This is work by uh, Jiho Jiang, uh, a physicist down at Memorial, but was a graduate student uh, that I uh, had the pleasure of supervising. And here we divide up cells into three categories cells that are uh, getting oxygen and glucose, they're we assume that they're proliferating with some, not 100% of the time. Uh, Mark Durst and others have shown that, that, uh, that blood delivery is intermittent and, uh, and slightly chaotic, but a large fraction of the time we're going to assume that they're in cell cycle. On the other end, you've got cells that aren't getting any glucose, they're not getting any oxygen. Those cells are very hypoxic, or, and basically they're dying. And this is, you know, goes back to comments made by Julie Denekamp years ago, 
when cells get very hypoxic, they die, but there is a category in between, and these are cells that are getting enough glucose to just roll on metabolically, and, uh, and these are the cells that are glowing on FDG. Now, we assume that, the re that cells are only really removed that are in the proliferating compartment, and they've, got, they've attempted to go through mitosis, and they failed. Okay, so that's the way we get volume regression, and then there's a re reduced competition for resources, all right? Cells go, that were going through proliferation die, they go away, reduced competition for resources, and then there's a reoxygenation, as we're all familiar with. You start out radiotherapy with an image of a tumor that has a lot of hypoxia, but for some tumors, we now know for example, head and neck, um, midway through treatment for most of the tumors, most of the hypoxia has gone. Not always, but in many cases. Okay, so I've already told you this about reoxygenation. So how does the, how does the model do? We, we just published this in clinical cancer research. Um, 36 cohorts, uh, thousands of patients, and this is a busy slide. Uh, from the paper, and I just um, uh, want to make want to make two points. First of all, the model has to be fit. There are some fitting parameters, but not many. And the, and the ones that we did fit make good radiobiological sense. So here uh, is the oxygen enhancement ratio. That is the increased resistance of increased resistance to to radiation from the lack of oxygen in those cells that are in the intermediately hypoxic compartment, the so-called OER, all right? Uh, and that's not three, but publications have shown that when you're chronically stressed with the lack of oxygen, you don't expect the OER to be three. It's more, it's not, in fact, the, the only publication on this comes out to be about 1.7, which is about where this maximum likelihood island is here. The alpha over beta ratio, we don't get what Jack Fowler taught classically, alpha over beta equal to 10. We get alpha over beta equal to about three, which is what you see in a, in a Petri dish. So it's closer to the in vitro numbers. And we get alpha values that are about 0.3, also very close to the in vitro numbers. So all these numbers make sense. And the, day, and the model really does fit all of the data. And by all of the data, I mean data from single fractionation, um, uh, shown in red. Uh, this is green. Uh, green is SPRT, 3 to 10 fractions. And then conventional fractionation, two, basically two, 1.8 to 2 gray a day, more, more or less. Now, if you, uh, if you used alpha over beta to 10, in an OER of two, say you just pull these out and say, how does that, how well does that work? These curves separate in terms of what the model predicts. But if you do this maximum likelihood fit, which is very reasonable since nobody really knows what these values are in situ, and, 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 and I should say these are early stage, not small cell lung cancers. So these are the, tend to, there are some larger tumors in this group, but for the most part, this is the relatively small tumors. And there's no guarantee, and, and, and then if you do that, you do the fit, they all lie on this curve here, um, which is almost you know, more than we could expect. Now I have to say that we, that we went back and we looked at Fowler's original equation with kickoff time, and it, and it actually fits the data almost as well. So we've done all this, you know, wrote a dissertation. We do this cellular simulations. Every 15 minutes, we're doing this reorganization of how the tumor is responding to radiation therapy. You get the same, you get a very similar correspondence between PCD50 uh, and, uh, and, and Fowler's equation with alpha over beta equals 10, kickoff time of 24 days, and a teapot of three days. So he's, you know, my, my hat is off to Jack uh, uh, for that. That's, a, that's amazing. Um, 
So we now we sort of derive this equation two different ways, and uh, I very much believe it. What does it mean? Uh, there are lots of treatment regimes where we're over-treating, and you can see that from the curve. So see all these green points up here? Uh, let me get that back. This is over-treatment, 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 until you get down to about here, just to where you really start actually losing something. Um, and these treatments, including many of our conventionally fractionated treatments, were just not intense enough to get, um, to get local control. Um, there are, you can see these uh, single fractionation results here. The original motivation for even doing this was claims uh, that it, when you give a single <laughs> fraction of radiation by CQ, Richard Kolesnik and others, something different happens. You get in a, um, a reperfusion injury through a ceramide pathway and that, and that that was uh, damaging the tumor and, and, and therefore a single fraction was going to be fundamentally different than multiple fractions. We don't see that. We just see one model and it can even be the Fowler model. The, the parameters won't have basic biological meaning in the Fowler model but it still fits the data incredibly well. Now that's long. And of course, the question comes up, does this sort of thing work as well in, in other sites? And uh, uh, we see that it works well in, uh, in head and neck. And I think it probably works well in prostate, but we haven't done much there. I've just seen some other, uh, some other calculations. So I think this sort of uh, data analysis could be very useful in choosing a dose that is hot enough, but not too hot for patients. Okay. So I think I've said most all of these things. We uh, then took this model forward to take into account the entire dose volume histogram because of course we want to know what happens when the dose is non-uniform. And we looked at a data set from Washington University and a data in a large, much larger data set from the NKI and found that <coughs> this, it, and this is a kind of a printout from a, a computer screen, but uh, basically dose is uh, going along, is in, the effective dose is going along the x-axis, tumor control probability, local control is the y-axis, and, uh, and these uh, circles uh, are the bend results from everything in between the bars, and they lie on the line, so the model seems to be going in the right direction uh, here as well. There's a still a, a lack of predictive, it, you can see it's not as uh, steep now that we're looking at these, these are tend to be larger tumors. The model's not as steep, so it's gonna be less useful clinically um, than, than that model that I showed you for the early stage uh, lung tumors. So we're looking at other factors now, in particular the FTG image. What can we derive from the FTG image and add to this model to potentially make it more predictive? Um, and you can stratify uh, by these uh, generalized tumor dose, we call it, values, and show that it's, uh, it's the lowest, the lowest, or excuse me, the highest risk third with the lowest GTD values. Uh, has a Kaplan-Meier curve that separates according to uh, uh, a log rank test. Uh, and then that's better than use something, using something like the PTP D95 value, which is something we use clinically. Okay. Can we connect modeling with image-derived parameters? So now let's get even a little more complicated. And uh, I got to work with uh, uh, this young physicist, Mireya Kristen Ordazar, who's now uh, a, a, a junior fellow at uh, Cambridge, and she took the model and added tumor cell migration so we could really look at regressing tumors uh, and applied that very briefly. And you can see these arrows. Basically, the idea is that cells will migrate towards chemical resources. 
you have extra chemical resources somewhere, why wouldn't a cell try to get over there? We, you know, is there really evidence that that's the case? I can't, it's, it's theoretical at this point. But you can uh, take this model and apply it to head and neck radiotherapy. And here we had uh, pretreatment F-misonidazole hypoxia images. This is work by uh, John Hum, um, Milan Gorkowski, uh, Nancy Lee, and others. And you look at histograms <coughs> of the, and K3, sorry, K3 here is really a stand-in. It's a, it's a parameter uh, uh, for those for, uh, familiar with this uh, kinetic modeling. It's basically the rate of entrapment <laughs> of the of F miso due to the hypoxia of the local cell. So you get this histogram um, and you have, let me just see if I can get this. So we have pretreatment data, which is the solid line. And then we took, two weeks later, we took another image and that's the dashed line. Um, the, solid, the, the solid line, we fit that with the model, that's the red points. And so it's not surprising that you can fit the pretreatment data. We're basically choosing parameters on a voxel by voxel basis to say, so we're applying a little tumor control probability model to each voxel and we're tuning the parameters then to each voxel. And then we're asking how should this histogram of these uptake values evolve over the course of radiotherapy. And sometimes, this works incredibly well. And I've just shown you two cases where it works really well. So the dashed uh, uh, curve is the simulation and the uh, green solid line is the actual data. And, and I, I would claim that this is excellent agreement between the simulation and the data. This is uh, uh, 10 days, 10 fractions, uh, uh, later, sorry, two weeks, not two weeks later, 10 fractions later. And here's a, the uh, similar situation for another patient, but it doesn't always work. So in about 60% in about of patients, this works tremendously well. But in some patients, it doesn't work at all. Now, to, to me, that's exciting because that means that we're getting at some of the underlying biological heterogeneity. Uh, and we could potentially make a clinical decision on that basis. So the, so lots more work to do. This was, um, uh, uh, this particular study hasn't even, uh, we haven't even got it published yet. So um, let's keep, let's keep going. Now radiomics. So what about data? I mentioned I would come back to the radiomics data that we're extracting straight from the image. What can we do with that? This is an area that's been popularized really by Philippe Lambaugh and collaborators from uh, Mastro, uh, in Maastricht, the Netherlands. And they look at, they segment uh, the tumors and they look at various kinds of features, shape features, statistical features from the, uh, the histogram. Um, uh, and, then do, and then you can do any kind of a big data uh, 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 style of analysis here. So shape, texture, their holes, is there necrosis in this tumor, pet intensity and so on. So here's one thing we've, we've done. Again, this is Mireya Chrisman Ortizar. And this paper was just accepted by the Greek Journal. So this will be in, in print soon. So what if you can uh, do f miso scans for head and neck cancer patients? Very few places have a cyclotron. Very few places are going to do that. But could we develop a surrogate that just looks at FEG and CT scans and data derived from FEG and CT scans? and put that in place of, an F, of the f miso information, okay? And in fact, we were sort of able to do that. Um, th this is, uh, shows two features that, uh, 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 that are derived from uh, both the, the CT, the contrast CT. We derived an, an imaging feature um, from the outline of the tumor, and we had uh, two regions. One region 
uh, was the region where FDG intensity was low, and we derived features just from the CT, and the other region is a region inside of that uh, ROI where the FDG signal was high, okay? And so these two features that we, we derived, uh, this stands for, uh, 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 it's a run length grade level uh, feature, and it basically says, do you have voxels next to each other that all have a high intensity on the CT scan that's about the same intense level? Do you have a connected region inside of the CT scan? Um, so what we saw was, sorry, this is where the f miso values are uh, low, uh, no hypoxia, f miso values, the, the uh, the tumor uh, to background or tumor to muscle ratio is high or in blue. And you can see when this, uh, this long run length feature is low and this feature is low, you tend to see that these tumors are not hypoxic. What's this feature? It's not the SUV max, it's the 90th percentile of the, intens of the intensity volume histogram. So we're not, so we found that that worked better than SUV max, okay? So then if you say, okay, we're, gonna, we're predicting F miso, we've got our predictor here where we put these two features together. So it turns out that, that if this predictor is below about two, then that tumor is not hypoxic. That tumor is not hypoxic. So you could imagine stratifying your patients according to non-hypoxic versus hypoxic uh, uh, type, type of regimen. Now what, uh, what Nancy Lee is doing at Memorial Sloan Kettering right now is actually making a decision about hypoxia after two weeks. So we still, and, and she's dose de-escalating dramatically in head and neck cancer, in HPV positive head and neck cancers after uh, a, a negative two-week f miso scan. But I think you can see the point. So we've taken some features out of the CT scan and out of the PET scan, and you, and, and you know, who would, you know, nobody would ever pick this kind of feature out without a data-driven analysis. You can't just say, well, I hypothesize that this feature is going to work. You have to get the data, look at lots of potential options. Okay. Um, so the next two things I want to show you just make the point that there's other information in imaging, in this case breast imaging, that relates to biological aggressiveness. So we took radiomic features from uh, breast MRI images. This was done with in particular, Haridi Veraragavan, but also, uh, who's a medical physicist, but also Elizabeth Sutton and Elizabeth Morris, who are radiologists at Memorial Sloan Kettering. We looked at the, the features from a single slice in the middle of a breast tumor. Um, and uh, looked at the histological grade and texture features and shape features and found something that's provocative. I wouldn't say it's good enough to be clinically useful yet, but there is some correlation between uh, dynamic contrast enhanced MRI features and oncotype DX score. The higher the, the oncotype DX score is, is an amalgam of uh, messenger RNA you know, microarray information that's been put together that tries to separate out aggressive breast tumors and less aggressive breast tumors. And so we just asked the question, could we possibly put together dynamic contrast enhanced MRI information that would correlate with it? And again, this is not a, you know, I don't want to oversell this. It's not a strong enough correlation that you can really act on it, but it makes the point. It's a, it's a statistically significant correlation so we're going to go back and we're going to look at this with a full 3D volume. And, and what are these features that we derived? The uh, kurtosis of the histogram of the gadolinium uh, in the post-contrast, I think this is about one minute, the post-contrast three is about three minutes. So the way this works out is if you get a peak in the post-contrast gadolinium intensity, 
you get a significant peak, and it's biologically aggressive, and it probably has to do with the vascularity of the, of the tumor. It's probably what we're picking up there. Also, of course, you know, no surprise, nuclear grade, a histological variable. Okay, fine. It uh, seem, seems to make the point. Here's another thing I, uh, 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 by uh, some other people at Memorial that just came out that Elizabeth Morris, a radiologist, and he's a core um, medical physicist, <coughs> showing that uh, the apparent diffusion coefficient value. If, uh, maybe uh, most of you are aware of this uh, relatively new type of imaging where you're lo really looking at the ability of, wa of water molecules to diffuse over a short time scale. So it really interrogates just how packed together cells are. So if you have a very low diffusion coefficient, cells are really packed in together. If you have a high diffusion coefficient, cells are, um, uh, cells are not packed in as, as, as much. And what they saw is that um, uh, for high, uh, high uh, oncotype DX uh, scores, you're getting a lower apparent diffusion coefficient. So cells are more packed in. It's kind of what you would, uh, what you would think, okay? So different kinds of imaging. You're getting a partial view of some of the, uh, the that there are biologically relevant parameters coming out of this imaging. So a lot of this stuff needs to be put together into a more comprehensive predictor that would be good enough to be clinically actionable, like Oncotype DX is an FDA-approved uh, tool for making uh, decisions about whether or not to get chemo or not. This is a study um, uh, with uh, Avis uh, Sala, radiologist, Alberto Vargas, radiologist, and Harini Barragavan, again, where we looked at the way in which textures are changing amongst uh, metastases um, in this case, uh, 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 ovarian uh, metastatic sites. And you can use radiomics features to see how the textures are changing. And then we think that has to do with either epigenetic or um, cellular subclonogens uh, that uh, have come forward uh, to dominate a lesion and it should be relevant to treatment response. Okay, let's keep going. Now, go, coming back to radiation oncology, let's talk about pneumonitis. So, uh, I was a part of the Quantech effort, and there we looked up, we looked at about 20 different endpoints and gathered data together uh, to try to understand what were the dose volume predictors for various toxicity endpoints. And pneumonitis, of course, was a big one that everybody is interested in. But when you put together, and, and, and at the time, the best predictor was mean lung dose to the non-GTV lung. But when you put together all this data, and it's really way too shallow to make it patient specific changes that, where you could really feel like you were making a big difference in the probability of the outcome. Now everybody, or at least everybody I know of, uses a sort of a threshold. I don't want to get above a certain risk here. And uh, in the early days of uh, 3D radiotherapy, uh, there were a group of patients that, uh, that died when uh, all of a sudden, we had these massive PTVs in lung, and we were giving massive doses to big, large volumes. But, um, but then, of course, people backed off uh, from, uh, 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 from those higher doses. So what can we do here? Uh, well, we looked at heart variables, uh, which, and it was a surprise that heart variables seem to have something to do with pneumonitis. This paper was published in act oncologica because the Red Journal editors just couldn't believe that heart variables <coughs> would have anything to do with radiation pneumonitis. Here's the heart D10, the minimum dose to the hottest 10% of the heart uh, here. 
And we had some, this, in the, uh, this is data from the early days of uh, 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 3D CRT at Washington University. There were some deaths here uh, that tended to be higher heart doses, more so than higher mean lung doses. And, uh, and the statistics is a little tricky, but this, this <coughs> is a better predictor heart compared to mean lung dose. So a model uh, would include lots of, would include both heart and lung. And so we're trying to sort that out. This is a, a model derived from Was another Washington University data set. Smoking is a, uh, has now been reported by several groups to be a predictor um, that is protective uh, during radiotherapy. And of course, I don't recommend that you tell your patients to start smoking. But it seems to be um, that as, as essentially there's already a reaction to reducing inflammation from the smoking that is somehow protective. Uh, and so we built models for smokers and models for non-smokers. And this included variables for uh, the laterality of the, uh, of the high dose volume, the max dose to the heart over here, also uh, uh, V40 to the heart, volume receiving more than 40 gray, which is not that different from the maximum dose. It's slightly, somewhat different and the maximum dose to the lung. So we're pulling out variables that maybe wouldn't be uh, obvious. Um, I think we still have a ways to go to generalize these models. One thing that can certainly happen, this, these models have not been tested on other data from other institutions. So you can develop a model that gets too tuned into the specific characteristics of the way patients were treated at that institution. So that can be a problem. Uh, we updated uh, pneumonitis and esophagitis modeling and tested a biological predictor that we thought looked interesting called alpha-2 microglobulin. It has to do with this uh, generalized process we think of pushing down inflammation due to smoking. And we split the data. And if you have a lot of data, enough data to do this, I recommend it. Two thirds for training, one third set aside for model validation. And we bootstrap the data. So that's the other reason why this slide is in here. What is bootstrapping? Bootstrapping is where you, you have some process for building a model. You take the data, you create a pseudo data set. How do you, and how do you do that? You basically blindly choose data from the original data set, one patient at a time, but you can choose the same patient more than once. So the computer is blindly choosing patients to put in the pseudo data set, but about 30% uh, of the time, there'll be repeats of, of data put in the pseudo data set. So this is a computer data set, a pseudo data set that only exists in the computer. You build your model on that. Then you repeat the process of randomly picking out patients to put in your bootstrap data set. You build the model again. And then you see how much it changes. So that's a very important uh, you know, point here. See how much your modeling changes when you're, when you're building these things. Uh, and this just shows histograms of these different, how often these different variables come up on bootstrap runs. For the sake of time, because I, there are a few other things I want to say, I'm going to just run through this part and to get to a couple other points. If you can build a data set that's large enough, you can, you can potentially see things that people just haven't seen in the literature so far. Most of the time when we looked at lay rectal bleeding and the Quantec, uh, Quantec analysis, we, we said, oh, it's probably the 10% of the highest dose region that causes late rectal bleeding. We put together a data set from um, seven different institutions, 1,000 patients, where we had the full 3D uh, dose volume uh, histograms. And we found something different than what Quantec thought. We really found that it was, it seems to be a combination of two things. And we split this into training and testing, both of which the, uh, did well on the model. Basically, if you've spared some of the rectum, that's good. And what's the meaning of that? 
It might be rescue. It might be stem cell rescue. For all we know, we don't know what the meaning of that is, but it came out very clearly. You need. You should spare some of the rectum. Get the minimum dose of the rectum down as low as you possibly can. And you. And actually, the mid regions of the dose, not just 74 gray. Alan Pollock's old rules of thumb and so on. It seems to be that it's really the mid-regions of the dose that are critical. Getting, getting below about 55 gray seems to be the, the, the critical dose level. So we tried everything on this data set. This, these models clearly come out to be the best. So you get enough data from multiple institutions that treat in different ways with different prescriptions, and you're no longer just getting a you know, something fed back to you that, that is too tied to the particular values used in that clinical trial. Okay, so that's the point about pooling data and why we really need to go to pooling data. Now I'm going to, uh, we'd like to put these dose response curves into the clinic. You know, I'm not, I'm not gonna talk too much more about this, although I'd be, I'd be happy to discuss it later with anyone. Uh, we also do, are doing a lot of data analyses uh, with uh, more purely biological variables. We're applying machine learning to the genome, for example, and finding out that, uh, yes, with machine learning methods, you can really pick out uh, why one patient maybe is more sensitive uh, with respect to erectile dysfunction, urinary toxicity, late rectal bleeding than another patient. So this, this uses uh, genome-wide array studies of SNPs, uh, up to a million SNPs on a, on a SNP, chip, SNP chip. These chips are now very inexpensive. You can buy one for uh, $100, and they can be processed for less than $100. So this sort of research is not out of the question. Uh, I don't really have a lot of time to talk about how we do this, but I do want to implant the idea that this can be done. And, I, and there is one thing I'll stop. Uh, so we, uh, and we, you can build this. This was built on a data set of 300 patients. So this was not a massive data set. Uh, uh, we used random forest machine learning and some other uh, changes that we put in. We studied rectal uh, bleeding, late rectal bleeding, um, urinary tox, and, and so this is our Patients grouped in increasing risk, uh, uh, increasing predicted risk over here, and uh, predicted low risk over here, and, and you can see the observed line is the red. This is on the validation data that we didn't touch during the, the model building, okay? So we know the model works, at least for this uh, institution, for this cohort, the way they treated patients. So that proves the principle. Now I just want to make a point. We also did erectile dysfunction models. Not as good, probably because the dose, I think, maybe the dosimetric variables are uh, more significant, the variability of the dosimetry between patients. But one of the things we're excited about with this type of approach is you can go back to the biology. So you do a machine learning model. You can then test which are the SNPs, the single nucleotide polymorphisms that are most important. You can rank all those. You can find the genes that uh, are associated with those SNPs. You can then go to curated bioinformatic databases like Metacore and other databases and see, uh, okay, what does that imply concerning the biological processes that are important? And in particular, you can look for core interacting protein gene networks. And we found when, we, when we've done this that what pops up is often uh, biology that's uh, genes that have already been identified as relevant for the endpoint in question. So, the, so uh, there, there's, I won't call that confirmation, but that's certainly evidence that we've gone in the right direction. But, you can, but <coughs> you can do this for any endpoint. And when you get to this phase, you're seeing biology that is definitely relevant for what happened in the clinic. Okay? 
Uh, so I, I want that message to come through loud and clear, even though I've, I've run through so many slides. And again, we've done, uh, the first paper did lay rectal bleeding and erectile dysfunction. And I'll, uh, uh, I'm happy to share the slides, by the way, with anyone who wants to, uh, to have a copy and you can go look at that. Now we've got a paper that's uh, in press on <coughs> urinary toxicity as well. Okay, so now we're almost to the finish line. I just wanna make a point about pathology partly because um, path the pathology is undergoing a revolution. And I know Emory in particular has an extremely strong computational pathology group. Uh, we've, we've started a company at Memorial around this. We're doing lots of different things. We recruited someone uh, named Thomas Fuchs, who's a machine learning expert in, in uh, computational pathology. So pathology, like radiological images, can be analyzed. In this analysis, you can do all kinds of things with this analysis. Um, there's a big need to have lots and lots of different kinds of, of the models <coughs> that are learned in pathology. In particular, pathologists spend about 30% of their time, uh, maybe even a little more, looking at slides with no cancer. And if a computational pathology tool could say, you don't need to look at those slides, that would be a big change for them. But for the purposes of this talk, the point is that you could quantify this information and then put it into other data analyses. Uh, and maybe, maybe discover some features that we didn't even know were important in pathology. Okay, seven deadly sins in predictive modeling, if you'll indulge me. Uh, first of all, not including standard variables that are known to be important. Okay, this is all easy, you know. I'm probably preaching to the choir here, but okay. Uh, not using cross-validation to characterize the training process. No validation data set, either secured from another institution or set aside. Now sometimes if you've got 50 patients, you might, you know, this, this might be the reality. You don't have this data. Feature extraction was not included in the cross-validation loop. If you choose your variables before you do cross-validation, forget it. And I've seen grant applications that have made this mistake. This is, uh, you would, you would, it's, it's a big one. Test the robustness, use something like bootstrapping. Just bootstrap the whole process. See if you get the same answer. So you got something on multivariate analysis. Do you get it the same thing when you bootstrap the data? Maybe you do, maybe you don't. It would be interesting to know. Um, actually, the point here, this is the point about bootstrapping that I just made. Number five is really about, if you're deriving some image feature, is it really robust? Is it robust across scanners and vendors and, and imaging protocols? Is it robust between 1.5T and 3T, or does it need to be? Is it robust after a coffee break test? Uh, if, 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 if there's a new image taken, is it robust? Try to figure out what features are robust in an analysis, put those in. One of the beauties of SNP, anal SNP chip analysis is it's a low noise technique for deriving data, unlike mRNA expression arrays. Very noisy. SNP chips, very reliable, <coughs> zeros and ones. Well, almost zeros and ones. Although you could do copy number variations as well. Okay, almost done. Uh, how much, I just wanna make a point about outcomes in the real world. That the prob this is a paper published in JAMA. The probability of death really depends on where you're treated. Um, uh, this is a bunch of different cancers, all averaged, adjusted, uh, but it's adjusted by age, sex, median income and comorbidity, and you can see there's a big difference between cancer specialty hospitals, NCI comprehensive hospitals, other academic centers, and community centers. We really don't understand these. These are pretty significant differences. We don't understand these differences. What really drives quality in cancer care? And I think big data analyses could be done to, uh, to help sort that out, okay? Uh, so, really, 
Uh, that's it, I just have a, uh, an advertisement here, which is don't throw away your data. Um, try to learn how to pool it, uh, and, and, and let's work together. Okay, that's it, thank you. Ready right now.